Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now one of Nigeria's and Africa's leading contemporary art galleries, Retro Africa, have launched their first ever US exhibition at the prestigious Lehman Maupin Gallery in New York. It's titled Do This in Memory of Us, and it's an exhibition that features Nigerian-American artist and writer Victor Ehikameno, Congolese painter Cherie Samba, and African-American artist Nate Lewis. Like most art exhibitions, it's built on a theme, the relationship between the ancient Nigerian Kingdom of Benin, contemporary Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, and the trajectory of the African diaspora in the New World, namely, in this case, of course, African Americans in the US. But beyond the commonalities, the exhibition also features the divergent cultural identities between uh, African heritage and the African American diaspora. Sounds intriguing, doesn't it? Well, in a moment, we'll speak to one of the artists whose work is being featured at that exhibition. But first, let's turn to Dolly Kola Balogun, founder of Retro Africa, the art gallery that's launched the exhibition, and she joins me now from New York. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I expect it's still early in the morning there, and with what we're hearing about blazing heat, um, I, I hope you've got the air conditioner turned on. So thank you very much indeed um, for coming in. First of all, tell us why you've decided to call the exhibition Do This in Memory of Us. Sounds intriguing, but presumably, you know, you've got, it's got nothing to do with the biblical sort of use of a similar phrase. Hi, um, pleasure to be here. No, not at all, actually. It's an eponymous a uh, title for the exhibition based off of uh, one of the installations that will be unveiled at, at one point during the course of the exhibition by Victor Ikemeno. It's an installation comprised of rosary beads um, and the piece itself is called Do This a Memory of Us. It features a slave ship that maps out the trajectory of the divergence between the African diaspora and the African continent and uh, you know, the period in which we were separated in history. But now the show is talking about our commonalities and our ability to find ourselves again through culture and through art and through our abilities to converse and exchange ideas. Sounds absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, and is that why you chose ancient Benin as, as an essential part of that sort of um, relationship between African art and African-American art? Yes, absolutely. Um, Victor Kimeno is actually an artist that uh, we've been working with for quite a while, and he's arguably one of the most prominent contemporary artists from Nigeria at the moment, uh, being one of the artists that was representing Nigeria at the Venice Biennale. Um, we thought that particularly at the moment, um, Benin history and Benin bronzes are at the forefront of a lot of new stories, notably in terms of, you know, uh, recent museums and um, to institutions deciding to return, um, you know, stolen artifacts and uh, bronzes um, back to Nigeria, either on loan or permanently to the government. Um, Victor Igemeno has been at the forefront of that agitation of discussing you know, restitution and restoration. And uh, a lot of his work actually is a contemporary take and a continuation of the, you know, the ancient traditions of not just bronze casting, but of, of art making in the region. And I think that uh, he is a great example for Nigerian artists to talk about how we can engage in contemporary discourse while still not relegating our history and our past to 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 the to the background, but looking looking at how we can absorb our culture and our heritage, while still engaging in contemporary discourse and and, and art making today. Well, that's that's the bit on ancient Benin, and then you take that and you add contemporary Democratic Republic of Congo, and the work of the African American artist Nate Lewis. What are you hoping that the three styles will tell? Well, for one, I think that 
the the storyline and the curatorial narrative about discussing how we are we were great there was a tragedy that occurred and we are still great today and there have been so many stories that we have told in the past are telling today uh, not just the story of slave trade but more importantly stories of contemporary life and our ability to resonate and engage with with the modern era is, is an important one to be able to tell from different perspectives and i thought that it would be important to if, we're, if I was going to present contemporary African artists that at least have a Francophone voice in that show that is not primarily or uniquely just from a Nigerian perspective. And also to have an African American voice as well, uh, because there's a lot of uh, change at the moment that is occurring in the art world in, in the US. And, um, you know, there are different stories to tell, not just about movements, about monuments, about heritage and about politics in, in the region. And I thought that to have that diverse perspective and have a range of different artists was important to be able to do justice to what we were trying to convey through the exhibition. Actually, that's a very important point that you make because, I mean, the, the, the fact that you've taken someone from English-speaking Africa and another from French-speaking Africa just tells the, the history, really, of um, European involvement on the continent, and then, of course, the, an African-American, which brings the diaspora bit into it. But, but we're rather curious about you, uh, Dolly. Um, are you yourself an artist or more of a sort of business person? I mean, tell us a bit about how you got into running an art gallery and one that clearly um, has become quite prominent. Well, I'm not an artist. I would love to be. I just don't have, happen to have the talent, but I'm a curator um, and I'm a gallerist. Um, my, I see myself really as a, I wouldn't like to use the word activist, but more of an advocate for the building of institutions, both locally on the continent and the uh, our ability to, to export our ideas and our art to the, to, the, to the world at large. And one of the means of doing so, of course, is through commercial galleries, you know, VR exhibitions and art fairs. But the other part of it is my desire, my desire to build local institutions, notably museums on the continent. And so at the moment, I am equally an advisor for the Quara State Government, who is currently building the first Museum of Contemporary Art in Nigeria, which will be the third Museum of Contemporary Art on the continent. Um, after the museum in, in uh, Morocco and the Zaitz Mokka in Cape Town. And so I see myself as sort of wearing two hats, which is on the one hand, in the commercial aspect, which gives artists a platform and, and a means to sell their art and also to be seen, to have their works placed in institutions abroad, not just in Europe and the US, but hopefully as well in East Asia and across the continent, the African continent, but also as someone who's looking to, to, to build a legacy on the continent as well to have those people come to Africa as well to engage with our stories to engage with the local culture to engage with the local people and to have a means for us to preserve our heritage going forward so that we don't have a repeat of what we're currently discussing in terms of restoration and restitution but we have a space in which young children who are in schools and at universities have a place that they can go and learn about art, learn about contemporary art, about ancient art, and have excursions and engage in culture in a way that's meaningful and intellectual and academic. And are you at all encouraged then, um, you're in New York there, by what you're seeing uh, in terms of the way that the international community is beginning to focus more on African art and is consuming African art much more volubly than they used to do in the past? Oh, absolutely. In fact, it's not even just African art, it's black art in general. I mean, this is, it's, been a, it's been a revolution of sorts in the last two years in which we've seen this, this shift in mindset and in opportunity that has been taking place across museums and, 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 and galleries in the US, um, post Black Lives Matter, post, post a, 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 a reckoning of sorts in which people are re-examining their portfolios and you know what they deem to be important and have suddenly rediscovered, right, or rather highlighted uh, a, a, an amount of brilliance that is taking place across 
the diaspora on the continent as well. And African artists are benefiting from that shift. But the work was really done by African Americans in the US who, you know, were for, fighting for their rights and who were engaging in discourse and discussing not just on, the matter, on, on matters of social justice, but also in matters of inclusion. And so for that reason, Africans now have a pathway as well to be able to be taken seriously, to be seen, to be heard. And more importantly, I would like to have this, the next step of this conversation to be a dialogue of sorts, a, a holding of hands between the diaspora, between African-Americans and Africans, not to be done through the lens or through the filter of European or Western institutions, but directly a direct engagement, a direct conversation, a direct relationship, either by Africans participating in biennales on the continent or us having shows in the US with African curators, African gallerists, African artists. I think it's time for us to take our own destiny into our own hands. And of course, engage with partners in the Western world, in the traditional arts space, by having galleries such as Lehman Mopin, who made a really brave and very, very encouraging decision to do this collaboration, this partnership in the first place, and to have us featured and, and uh, in their in their space and have a, a gallery takeover of their 22nd Street space, which is one of their top spaces, you know, a, across the world. And I think that that says a lot in terms of what where people are heading at the moment. Well, that's a good point uh, because, of course, that there is the. Uh, I, I I particularly um, uh, welcome what you said there about working in partnership because I mean there is the perception that this is uh, you know you, you could well have sort of um, Western galleries and so on dominating uh, this sort of traffic of African art going to the West, where, and you you'd have sort of African galleries not really getting a piece of the action. So I'm glad that you. You talked about the fact that the way forward is a partnership. And, and this is the first ever exhibition of the Retro Africa Art Gallery in New York. What's been the reaction to it? It, it opened just a couple of days ago, didn't it? Yeah. it? The reaction has been phenomenal. It's been amazing. We had an amazing opening in which we had people. I mean, we, we saw a real diversity in terms of those who attend the show. We had Africa. Americans, we had Africans, we had Nigerians, we had institutions, we had the director of the new museum attend, we had Andrew Cohn, who was the CEO of the Whitney Museum, we had venture capitalist, um, you know, patrons and collectors attend. Um, it was really a melting pot of people. And surprisingly, I was told that, you know, post uh, COVID, this is, it was arguably one of the most well attended shows in the Chelsea district, you know, with the exception of uh, an exhibition I recently attended at Pace Gallery. Um, I, I was su pleasantly surprised. I was happy. The show is on for another month. It's on, on until the 17th of August. So I anticipate having more people come by, people who haven't had the privilege of seeing the show and, you know, just ha having the ability to, to talk with the artists as well and for, you know, possibly having an artist talk as well and a few other dialogues with you know, uh, participating artist Nate Lewis with Victor Ikemeno is currently in the US. Sher Samba unfortunately isn't here, but you know, thanks to uh, Galerie Magnin from Paris, we were able to have a consignment of his works and to be able to re-engage deeply with conversations that are taking place in the DRC. So, you know, I, I just see it as a very positive uh, development. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dolly Collar Balogun, for um, spending time with us and, and talking to us about your your uh, exhibition. It sounds fascinating. Uh, Dr. Dolly Collar Balogun is the founder of Retro Africa, the art gallery that's launched an exhibition in New York. And you're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the intersection between African and African American art. We'll speak to Nate Lewis, one of the artists whose work is featured at that New York Retro Africa exhibition. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles and you Golden. Now let's continue our examination of the intersection between African and African American art as we ask what's the connection between the two? Well, if you're keen to explore the resonances and the divergences between both identities, you may want to attend a new exhibition in New York titled Do This in Memory of Us 
which examines the relationship between the ancient Nigerian kingdom of Benin, contemporary DR Congo, and the trajectory of the African diaspora in the new world of America. One of the artists whose work is featured in that Retro Africa exhibition is Nate Lewis. He's an African-American and he explores art and history through patterns, textures, and rhythm and his works challenge people's perspectives of race and history through distortion and illusion. Sounds brilliant, doesn't it? And the artist Nate Lewis joins me now from New York. Nate, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I understand you had to get up rather early to do this, so we appreciate it. We're a few hours ahead of you. Um, just tell us more about your work as an artist and the desire that drives your creations. A lot of it, I understand, is driven by empathy and challenge. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, grateful to be uh, on your network and on this program. You know, um, <clears throat> it's interesting. I feel um, a lot of my conviction in making my work came from my experiences um, in working as an intensive care unit registered nurse um, for nine years. There was just um, there was a lot of uh, being being so close to um, so many people's lives, being so close to such a diverse range of of people's lives, the most intense moments, you know, of their life, of the patients, of the family members, um, you know, being in that position really um, challenged myself to really become porous and really take in other experiences um, other than myself um, and just really let them marinate within and let them uh, shape my lens, you know, of, of living, of seeing, of caring. And um, also just um, taking care of the, the, the human body um, really allowed me to become a lot more sensitive, have a lot more uh, greater skills of like assessment, of seeing, you know, because taking care of someone, there's an element of seeing, you know, you have to assess the body in a, in, a, in, a, in a visual way, but you also have to assess the body also in a way through sound. You know, you listen to the lungs, you listen to hearts, you know, you listen to the, the, the stomach sounds. And it really just caused me to sharpen all those senses in a way in which bringing those assessment skills and understanding of what balance is and how to find balance within things, <clears throat> it caused me to, to see the world in that way. And, you know, with, in, in, in uh, medical diagnostics, like using imagery like MRIs, X-rays, um, CT scans, um, drawing blood, everything we do, you know, in healthcare is directed towards, uh, it's a lens of caring. So, you know, my work, and using cam the camera, you know, it's thinking about how do you use a, how do you use a lens and how do you shape your lens of seeing with a lens of care, you know. So that's um, a huge conviction in my work and in all that I do. And I mean, uh, just listening to you there, it, it's just enormously curious, isn't it, that you have a degree? I think it's in nursing, and 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 that medical experience is reflected in your work. I, I'm, I'm intrigued. Which came first, the medical background or, or the art? Yeah, absolutely. The, the medical background. I didn't grow up um, making art at all. Um, the first time I drew in my life is in 2010. Um, I was 25 at that time. And um, I planned on going into, you know, into nursing since I was in like fifth or sixth grade. And then I um, in 2000, by the time 2010 came around, I was already three years into working um, as a nurse. So a, a later thing in my life, but um, my sister's an artist and, um, you know, my, my father's father was a musician. So I think it was, uh, you know, in the family. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that's interesting. And uh, that, that's, an, I mean, an interesting background to have, even though, of course, you ended up in medical science, but, but how would you say that what you do with your art intersects with or diverges from African art? And in that context, how does one assess the relationship between the two? 
Yeah, um, I think the language, the language is that I came about in my work, <clears throat> really, a lot of people think it lends itself to um, like an, an African aesthetic. And I don't know if that came about just because, um, just because of what I pay attention to, to. The thing is, I mean, if I think about patterns and textures, which is something I'm very drawn to, I, I ended up being drawn to patterns a lot and textures a lot, I think because of, um, a lot of it is just, I think about patterns and textures in this way of like this, this cellular way. You know, I think of patterns and I think about, I think about like cellular patterns and cellular tissues. But then if I think about, you know, patterns um, and, and textures, you know, from regions, you know, I think about them. It's like, you know, these, these patterns and textures that people have used and they came about for a certain reasons. And I think that people, you know, patterns um, and rhythms and textures come about from, uh, from the natural world, you know, from what we see, what we see in plants, what we see in flowers, what we see in animals. And I think because, you know, I, I approach, you know, I'm a self, I'm a self-taught artist and, you know, I approach, you know, my, my work from, you know, from tapping into, tapping into my spirit, you know, and tapping into um, what, tapping into what I feel and not trying to be, not trying to find a, uh, a language outside of who I am really trying to tap into a language that is, you know, singular to myself. And I feel like there's something about that and something about patterns that just, you know, comes from, um, you know, the natural, natural ways of seeing um, just, you know, what we're surrounded by. And um, also, you know, music as well, you know, and I, I think when I choose to tap into that, it, it, it feels more of uh, um, something, you know, of the, of, of the land, you know, and what's present in the spirit. And I think um, there's something in the, um, you know, African uh, traditions and African ways of making that tap into the similar thing. Right, and, and uh, I was reading your, your, a bit of your bio there, and, and there is, uh, according to it, that the tension uh, that exists within and without us, and, and I suppose what you see uh, is 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 the is within us from a sort of medical point of view, or, or is that a spiritual sort of perception? In, in other words, do you see when you when you're talking about within and without, do you see looking inside a physical or, or a spiritual side or both, a combination of the two? Yeah, I, I absolutely see it as a as a combination of the two, and I guess I see. <clears throat> A relationship, you know, amongst the combination of the two, um, because I think I think there is a, you know, I think there is a relation amongst the the conversation of the two, um, and I mean it can be physical, it can be spiritual, but you know it can be psychological and, and mental, you know, um, you know finding we have all have different ways of uh, of finding clarity, and sometimes finding clarity you have to challenge, you have to challenge oneself, you know, and um, you have to allow oneself to, to be porous. And sometimes you have to allow yourself to take in um, information, ideas that you don't, uh, you don't, that potentially may cause pain for yourself. Um, that may potentially, I mean, I know myself, you know, working, you know, and the experiences I went through, you know, I had to I went through a lot, you know, in terms of uh, really, really being present, you know, with those people who I would take care of and trying to be closer than trying to create distance um, to, you know, protect myself. Okay. Well, Nate, I, I want to say it's been brilliant talking with you. And uh, Nate uh, Lewis is, is an African-American artist and uh, he is, uh, his works are being exhibited at the moment by Retro Africa at the Lehman Morpin Gallery in New York. And you can see it there. It's titled, Do This in Memory of Us. That's the title of the exhibition. That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and New York. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.